sure. So, my name's Logan Perkins. I'm an attorney, and I do mostly criminal defense work with a passion for defending protesters and people arrested uh, in furtherance of social and political action goals. And part of the reason that's my passion is because that's what I did for 10 years before I went to law school. Let me get this one closer. Do you remember what brought the First Amendment and freedom of speech home to you, and when did you learn there's a First Amendment? Sure. So, um, I learned there was a First Amendment definitely in school, in public school growing up, uh, in some American history or government class. And I have a very distinct memory of a government teacher I had in high school who talked to us about civil liberties and the formation of the Constitution and why the Bill of Rights was enacted. and. He took us back to the sort of French uh, Revolution and Enlightenment thinking about civil liberties. And uh, the quote, I think, is often attributed to Voltaire, but it's not really clear historically whether it's actually Voltaire. But the quote is, I may disagree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And that principle of the free exchange of ideas and intellectual thought and discourse and dispute even um, really resonated for me. It was something I grew up with and my family dinner table often was characterized by discourse, put politely. And uh, you know, we really, I really lived that and I think had a, was lucky enough to grow up in a family where different ideas were allowed to be voiced and that we could disagree and have different ideas and different opinions about things. Um, but shortly after leaving to go to college, I got involved in political activism. And I think as soon as you step into real political activism in this country, you come to appreciate the nature of the First Amendment because you can quickly find yourself saying things which are not popular, which are uh, not common, which are not mainstream, and which might be shocking or disruptive or uh, unwelcome by a lot of people. And to have that sense that you can do that and you can say those things and you can even be confrontational in how you say those things and be protected by this fundamental value in our nation that the 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 exchange, free exchange of ideas is held in such high regard that it's given the highest protection in the land. You kind of answered this. Did your parents or grandparents talk about the First Amendment? So I think the answer is no, uh, not specifically, right? Although I will say maybe my father, who's also a lawyer and someone I often disagree with, uh, probably as a child, you know, would have uh, said something to the effect of, you know, I, uh, well, you're totally wrong, but that's your right. <laughs> so, you know, ha having that, uh, having that space to, you know, be right or wrong or in dispute or disagreement with your parents is pretty important. I think I respect that he allowed me to disagree with him in that way. How does a right to free speech touch your life personally many ways, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does, yep. So, I mean, professionally, I end up doing a lot of work uh, in that respect, that I do a lot of work where I am evaluating and uh, reviewing and attempting to hold the government accountable for maintaining that ideal and uh, trying to be the person who interfaces between the right that all people have and the power of the government, which has a tendency to uh, creep up on or infringe upon that right, and to stand between uh, that and to try to make a space for the people to exercise their right and be free from government interference as they do so. 
So in that respect, it, it really is a part of my daily work. And the more uh, the people I know who are uh, standing up for what they think is right and coming into conflict with uh, the government on that respect, the more of that work there is to do. So I encourage people to do that, to, to say what they think and to be vocal and to be in the streets and to be um, making a demonstration of their ideas. And when I encourage them to do that, I tell them I'm there for them. So if they uh, find that the government doesn't respect their right to do that, that's the work I love to do and I'm, I'm happy to serve folks in that way. I will say that I had a personal experience with an infringement on free speech when I was an activist before I went to law school. And that was that I was working with a group of people doing some environmental work in Maine. We were opposing the Plum Creek development plan for the Moosehead Lake region, which uh, ultimately Plum Creek did succeed in rezoning a, a 400,000 acre swath of the Moosehead region for development. Although, thank goodness the bottom fell out of the real estate market because they haven't actually done that yet. But in organizing with this group of people, I did a lot of media work. So I gave a lot of interviews, I talked to a lot of reporters, I talked to newspaper reporters and TV reporters and radio reporters, and my name was often attached to this group's efforts to do that because I was a designated media person for our, our group that was working on this. and. Uh, at some point, uh, somebody started paying attention to the fact that my name was often involved in that, and I got a visit from the FBI, who wanted to talk to me about my work uh, opposing the Plum Creek Plan, and ask whether I knew anything about some arsons, and some property destruction, and some other allegations that the FBI was uh, accusing people of being linked to the opposition of the Plum Creek Plan and that they targeted me and came to talk to me and came and knocked on the door at my house and called my former employer to see if I was available for an interview and really asserted themselves in my life in that way uh, to try to question me because I had been exercising my right to speak to the press about these issues that I became a target for them. And I really believe that they were trying to scare me trying to silence me and trying to interfere in the effectiveness with which we were opposing the Plum Creek plan. And I'm happy to say it didn't work, uh, but that's partly because I knew my rights and I knew that I didn't have to talk to them. And I knew that I had a right to talk to the press about the work that we were doing and to be free from intimidation for doing so. What protests or moments in your community do you recall people practicing free speech? Um, I, I wonder if that's the asking as you as a lawyer, what moments come to mind most, with most emphasis, what do I want to say? What protests or moments in your community do you recall people practicing free speech? Because you've kind of got a before and a yeah. before and an after. Yeah, I sure do. I mean, I, uh, I have a recollection of, uh, you know, the example I just gave about being a subject of inquiry by the FBI in, I think, retaliation for my speech efforts. But I also um, have had this experience as an attorney working with people who are uh, striving for social change where the police are very clearly treating them differently because of their message because of the reason they're there, because of what they're saying or what they're trying to do or what they're trying to change or accomplish in the world, they're being treated differently than the average bystander. And that is fundamentally so uh, abhorrent to the First Amendment and to the right to free expression that all Americans should cherish in their hearts and in their spirits and in their minds that I, I see that happening and I feel so enraged at law enforcement overstepping. I expect law enforcement to be champions of the Constitution, not be violating the Constitution by infringing on people's free speech. So a good recent example of that is a case we tried in February 
where I represented three defendants out of nine or eight who were arrested outside of Bath Ironworks at a situation where there was a christening of a warship happening and my clients, among others, were um, there to try to show all the dignitaries and the politicians and these fancy people who were attending this celebration of our, our power of destruction and war-making ability that there was something else we could be doing with this important economic engine in the Bath region. So my clients were there, they were completely nonviolent, they were very peaceful, but they were really trying to position themselves physically in a space where they could convey their message effectively to, I might say, our senators and our con Congress people who were going to this christening. And so this is core political speech. This is, this is individuals who want to communicate a specific message to their elected officials, among other people. And Bath Police Department decided that they were in the way. And you can take that to mean whatever you want, whether they were physically in the way, whether they were in the way because they were raining on the parade that day of the celebration of bombs and guns and warships that the government wanted to be putting forward and celebrating our, our capacity to blow up half the planet if we choose to, or because they were there saying something, speaking truth to power, or criticizing the status quo in a way that might make people uncomfortable. And in that respect, they were in the way of Bath Police and the Bath Ironworks security people, and they were arrested for that. And to me, that is a, such a great example of why we have the First Amendment and why the First Amendment should be enforced and why law enforcement should understand and respect and champion the First Amendment instead of understanding and respecting and championing the convenience or the comfort of the senators and Congress people that day who they didn't want to have exposed to this contrary point of view, right? That's, that's the opposite of what the First Amendment is supposed to do. The First Amendment is designed to ensure that our elected officials are exposed to contrary points of view, to the wide range of opinions, ideas, and discourse, and thought, and political ideologies that exist in this country. Wow. You said this was going to be short. You didn't know. <laughs> That's just uh, great. Uh, okay. Um, do you think the public... It's almost as if you can't... That's a block of of what you said, though. You can't... You can't short. Do you think the public has an obligation to the First Amendment? Sure. Yeah. The public absolutely has an obligation to the First Amendment. I mean... Frederick Douglass, who was a famous abolitionist, said uh, the limits are, of tyrants are prescribed by the tolerance of those whom they would seek to oppress. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it's that close. In other words, use it or lose it, people. Like, we have this right to free speech, to free exp expression, to free uh, exchange of political ideas and social discourse. And if we don't use it, we're going to lose it. And that is, I think, so critical to in our modern world that we have to continue to speak up. We have to continue to uh, disagree. We have to continue to object, to protest, to vocalize our, our disagreements and our disapproval of the status quo uh, or of the way of the decisions of our elected officials or of the way things are proceeding. We have to be able to criticize that. And if we don't, I'm, I'm deeply concerned that the trend in this country is to, to criminalize or to dismiss or to shame those who speak up. And I think the NFL protests are a great example of that, the Take a Knee movement, and that the NFL now in response to pressure from the federal government has said that they're not going to allow protesters to take a knee during the national, they're not going to allow players to take a knee during the national anthem is tragic to me. That the, that expression by the players of their, um, of their feelings, of their ideas, that, that speech through conduct that they're engaged in 
that's going to be limited by their employers now, which is really a pseudo private entity because the NFL is like clearly responding to the federal government's critique of this, to the president's critique of the Take a Knee movement. That is really disappointing and disturbing to me that they're threatening to find players who engage in that. Now, they're on the job technically, they're they're technically, it's not the government who's censoring them, but I think this is an example of why we as the public have to commit to defending people who are speaking out in that way and that, you know, their ability to take a knee on the field is really, really good example of the type of free expression that should be protected by the First Amendment. And while it may be a private entity who's currently interfering in that, I still think that's an example of how the public needs to push back against that and say, you know what, we may disagree with their take a knee movement and their take a knee message, but they should have the right to do that no matter what. The world is a very different place from when the Bill of Rights was adopted in 1791. Is the First Amendment still powerful enough for the world today? I mean, I think that is a great follow-up question to this issue with the NFL, right? Because the First Amendment does not prohibit a private entity like Roger Goodell in the NFL from restricting speech, which is exactly what they've done. They've said to the players, you can't take a knee on the field. You can stay in the locker room, but you can't do this public demonstration, this public conduct or expressive conduct anymore, or we're going to fine you or fire you or whatever. The First Amendment doesn't reach that. The First Amendment doesn't prohibit the NFL from imposing that regulation on their players because it's a private, non-governmental entity. And I think that that is really problematic, that, that when we begin to censor employees or public figures, which let's be clear, NFL players are all very public figures, ability to engage in expressive conduct or speech, we're really revealing the limitations of that constitutional power of that First Amendment because it really is only a limit on government. It's not a limit on private entities. Now, the flip side of that is like what we see happening on college campuses, whether it's in Berkeley or Middlebury or wherever, where we see leftist students shutting down the speech activities. So again, non-government actors shutting down the speech activities of conservative or right-wing speakers who have come to their campuses. So for me, again, the First Amendment is not implicated there because these are not governmental actors. These are private individuals who are trying to stop speech. And we could discuss the wisdom of that as a political strategy or as a way of being in the world in, in discourse or an exchange of ideas or being respectful to one another or not. But really that shows the limits of the First Amendment. And in a society and in a time and place where private entities have gotten so much power, where Google and Facebook and the NFL and Middlebury College have so much power, but the First Amendment doesn't apply to them, I think we're really seeing the limitations of that and we're seeing the shortfall of that approach, that it, it's only a restriction on the government interacting with people. It's not a restriction on private entities interacting with people. So in that sense, you know, would I like to see a society adopt a First Amendment-like status or idea or right or protection against private actors as well? Maybe I would. Yeah, so the next question is, how would you modify the First Amendment for the 21st century, if you could? Yeah, so I mean, I think fundamentally, it's not about modifying the First Amendment because the First Amendment itself is limited to protections from the government. And that is hugely important, right? Let Don't get me wrong. We have to be protected from government entities that would seek to silence dissent. That is fundamental to a free and democratic society. But the some of the conflicts we're seeing with respect to free speech and free expression today really have to do with private entities restricting free speech and free expression. So is that a change to the First Amendment? No. Is it a change in how we as a society think about the importance of the free exchange of ideas and discourse and uh, dissent? Yes. So for me, it's not about rewriting or changing the First Amendment. It's about a societal shift in our thinking about how we relate to disagreement, dissent, and political discourse. 
Should there be some kinds of things that people should not say? I think this is such a hard question and is a really personal, um, the, the answer is really personal and an individual for everyone. You know, do I think the government should be able to restrict people from saying certain things is a different question, but the classic example, like, should you be allowed to yell fire in a movie theater, right? Like, n no, you shouldn't be allowed to panic people and cause a, you know, extreme reaction or a public danger in this way. But should you be allowed to say, we have the right to overthrow the government and we should get on that? Yes, we should be allowed to say that, right? So the problem with the, the, the legal doctrines that parse out what the limits are on free speech uh, are that they involve line drawing and those are subjective processes, right? So is it cleaner to say, you know, the government cannot restrict speech? Sure, but in reality, you know, there are things you can't say and, and really things you can't do, which is maybe the more important thing that, you know, sticks and stones and all that. Is there such a thing as a spirit of the First Amendment? Whatever that means. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think so. I mean, yeah, I think the right to dissent, you know, I think Thomas Jefferson is, is famous for saying, you know, the people ought to overthrow the government anytime the government ceases to meet their needs. So I think that might be the spirit of the First Amendment, <laughs> that in order to do that, in order to periodically overthrow the government, we really have to be able to talk about it. Do you benefit from free speech? I mean, absolutely, right? I'm not in jail right now. <laughs> I certainly oppose the government and I'm not shy about saying it and they haven't locked me up yet. Um, okay, we're almost done. This was uh, kind of the second part of their, their panel of questions and that is at the end of the free speech week, they're gonna have a panel of experts. I don't know who they are. Um, do you have any questions that you might ask of those experts? No, I don't, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, any, anything else? Oh. Anything else? Let me, let me restart this. So if you have any other... Okay, we're rolling. Or if, there think, if there's a question that they left off that you think should be on there, that you want to answer, mm. is the last part. Um, I mean, I think the thing that I would say to my my community members is that perhaps in my lifetime certainly or in living memory there has not been a more important moment to exercise your right to dissent and that it may feel uh, small or ineffective or like you're not really accomplishing anything but to raise your voice in dissent is to use your right to, to free expression and to free political speech under the First Amendment. And I really believe that we cannot continue to exist in a pluralistic democratic society if we're not willing to raise our voices in dissent. And it has to be safe to do that, whether you're left wing or right wing or uh, conservative racist jerk or a softy liberal uh, you know bleeding heart peacenik you have to be able to say what you think and uh, and then also you know not as a political right not as a constitutional right but as a personal uh, ethic you have to be able to hear what other people say and hopefully have a better answer than they do Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lo.